Well, good morning, Walden Church. We are back for our fifth time together. We're going through a 10-week series as we head towards Easter. We're talking about Jesus and looking at the different encounters that he had with various people in his community, in his ministry, people that either asked questions of him or people that needed healing from him. And hopefully, through this, it feels like we are taking you by the hand to come and see Jesus. On our first encounter, we saw the woman at the well, and we saw a Jesus that was loving, but also a Jesus who asks us for holiness. On week two, we saw Jesus heal. He healed Jairus' daughter, raised her from the dead. We saw Jesus heal the woman that was uh, sick with blood. And we said that here is a Jesus that allows his life to be interrupted by us. We saw Jesus heal the blind man. We saw a God that is both merciful and just. And last week, we said that Jesus is both lion and lamb. And to be honest, all those things seem to be opposed to one another. We wonder how they could exist within the same being, but God is all those things. I hope you see a God that is holy and just and merciful, a God who has time for you, a God who loves you, a God who is both lion and lamb. Come and see Jesus. Today is going to be a little rough. <laughs> I'm going to do my best, but this passage I think is often misunderstood. And I want you to think back perhaps to the woman at the well. And if you remember when we were reading that and we first read it, the words Jesus said felt a little flat on the page. It kind of came across a little dry. At first glance, when you read it, it almost sounds like Jesus isn't being nice. But we know Jesus is nice. We know he is loving. So what we saw as we studied the passage was that Jesus was just being direct. He was being a little confrontational. And we said that Jesus was acting that way because he was taking this woman face to face with the things that were holding her back in life. He didn't want to dance around her sin. He wanted to pull the darkness away, expose her sin so that she could see what was keeping her in chains. Jesus did this as an act of love. This is his child. And when Jesus sees his child, he does everything he can to set them free. So Jesus calls her out on her sin. He doesn't waste time with her. He doesn't dance around the subject with her. Jesus doesn't necessarily do things the way we think he should. Did you ever notice that? Personally, I think it's weird that we would even expect God to act like us, right? <laughs> we always get a little uh, out of shape when we we, we think, well, Jesus didn't do it the way I would have done it. I don't think God ever does things the way we would do them. And so Jesus gets his fair share of critics, people that judge him and label him, because we compare him to a human condition. We compare him to how we would do it. Jesus had a reputation because of that. In Matthew 11, it says, the Son of Man came eating and drinking and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Well, what do we always say? You're guilty by association, right? Was Jesus a drunk just because he hung out with drunks? Of course not. I don't know if you've noticed this, but when you read the Bible, Jesus is often misunderstood. And sadly, this great chapter that we're going to read today is another one of those moments. Matthew 15, verse 21 says, And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. So right away, we see the phrase, Jesus went away from there. Now, rent, went away from where, <laughs> right? Well, from hanging out with the Jews. The previous portion of this chapter was another altercation between Jesus and the religious leaders. So Jesus pulls away for a time and he goes to Tyre and Sidon. Now, where is that? Where is Tyre and Sidon? Well, whenever Tyre and Sidon are mentioned in the Bible, 
It's always bad. Tyre and Sidon were cities that were against all the prophets of the Old Testament. They had been judged by God as a wicked place. In fact, right now, Tyre and Sidon are about where Lebanon is. So in this chapter, Jesus is now outside of Israel, and he's in Gentile territory. Why does Jesus go there? Well, Jesus goes there because right now the heat is on. People are after him. They're looking for him. Maybe about now people might be thinking they might like to arrest him or kill him. And Jesus knows that this isn't his time. So he gets away from his own people. He goes into hiding. This is why the Bible says Jesus is withdrawing. Jesus is, Jesus is going on his own exodus. Verse 22 says, And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Notice right away that the Bible calls out her ethnicity. Why? Well, again, Canaanites are mentioned 150 times in the Bible, and every time it's always as a wicked and idolatrous nation. They were people who were descended from Noah's grandson, Canaan. The Canaanites are described as a large and fierce people. They were strong and not easily defeated. The Israelites had to call on God to help them uh, defeat the Canaanites, and then Israel came in and took their land away. And despite a long campaign to fully drive them out, many of them stayed in these little pockets. Some of them even became slaves. Why does the Bible mention her ethnicity? Well, because to a Jew, she is the enemy. And she doesn't act like an enemy, does she? No, she cries out to Jesus with respect in worship. She doesn't act like an enemy. She comes in a posture of reverence and she asks for mercy. And Jesus, Jesus gives mercy, right? He's in the mercy business. This is his jam. I mean, look at what happened the last time someone made this same request. In Luke 18, it says, as Jesus drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So same plea, right? The same plea as the Canaanite woman. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. And he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people. When they saw it, they gave praise to God. So logically, if that story went that direction, this story should go the same way. Jesus should respond the same way. Because if it's one thing that I know about Jesus, he's predictable, <laughs> right? No. Jesus does not treat the situation the same way. Same cry, same ask, but different reaction from Jesus. In fact, if you notice, Jesus rarely gives the same answer. He rarely heals the same way. Just when you think you can classify Jesus, that you can understand him, that you can put him in a box and define him, Jesus will go and do something completely different. Remember, remember where we are, right? We're in Gentile territory. And who are we talking to? A woman and a Canaanite who is traditionally the enemy of the Jewish people. Verse 22 says, Behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But she's not acting like an enemy. In fact, here she is calling him Lord. It's the Greek word kurios, which is where we would get the same word for master or messiah. This should be right in Jesus' wheelhouse. This is what he has come to do. Release prisoners, set captives free, recovery of sight to the blind. This is, this is his mission statement. We've been reading Jesus' mission statement. Let's read it again. The Bible says Jesus goes into the synagogue. He grabs the scroll of Isaiah and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the mission statement of someone who has come to help, right? So here we go. We're going to see Jesus help, aren't we? Verse 23, but he did not answer her a word. What? This is not what we would expect. Is Jesus ignoring her? Would Jesus ignore someone asking for help? Would he treat somebody poorly? I mean, what do you think? I mean, just even consider all the stories that we've read so far. Did Jesus ignore Jairus? Did Jesus ignore the woman who was sick with blood? No. Jesus didn't even ignore uh, the man who was possessed by demons when his whole town ignored him. Jesus didn't ignore him. Jesus does not ignore people. And he does not treat people with contempt. Now, some of Jesus' opponents, they might use this story to suggest that Jesus is a racist. Or that he's sexist. I know you don't believe that. I don't either. So there has to be another reason for this, right? So what could it be? And I think it's hard because we're not there in the room. We are reading cold words on a page and we can't see this scene with our eyes. We can't hear his inflection. We're, we're even foreigners to this culture. We're, we're viewers from another time period. But I am familiar enough with Jesus to know that whenever he bends down and starts writing in the sand, whenever he spits on the ground and makes mud, whenever he steals a small boy's lunch, he is starting to teach. Jesus did three things in his life. He preached, he taught, he healed. But what is the difference? between preaching and teaching. Well, preaching is proclaiming. It's heralding. It's an announcement to the people. We can preach the gospel, especially to people who've never heard it before. But teaching is explaining things about the gospel that perhaps people don't understand. Teaching is, is instructing others how to live and how to best navigate the things that they read in the Bible. The most helpful illustration I ever heard of this was uh, given by John Piper. John Piper said, just picture a town crier and he's riding into town, he's on his horse and he shouts, hear ye, hear ye, the emperor has declared an amnesty to all slaves. Piper says, well, that's preaching. It's an announcement, it's a proclamation of good news. Something has happened, and the town crier lets everybody know. But Piper says, what happens if the people who hear the message then have questions? Like, what does amnesty mean? And when does this amnesty take effect? Can I leave my owner today? At that point, Piper says, you have to start teaching. In other words, you have to explain the implications of your news. You have to help people with concepts and ideas that they don't understand. Jesus was a preacher, but he was also a teacher. And every, whenever we see something that perhaps looks a little off with Jesus' character, and we wonder, why is he acting like that? I bet if we're quiet and we put our suspicions aside just for a moment, maybe our own human bias, and we sit still, we might see the way Jesus teaches. Verse 23 continues, And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. Wait. Do the disciples come on her behalf? Do they make an argument for her case? Do they say, Jesus, you really should heal her. Heal her daughter. Answer her request. No. Instead, they say, can you get rid of her? She is annoying. She's bothering them. And because they're in Gentile country, and because she's a woman, the disciples 
just default to their own bias. Why would they make an argument for her? Well, doesn't Jesus always heal? Didn't we just see him raise Jairus' daughter? Didn't we just watch Jesus heal a woman who pushed her way through the crowd? Why do they say, send her away? How does Jesus respond? Verse 24, he answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, here's the confusing part. Because when it's on the page, it's hard to read in the nuance of what Jesus is saying. You know when people speak, they have inflection, they have subtle hints to what they're thinking and what they're trying to say? We miss out on all of that here. So let's just rule out what he's not saying, okay? Because it sounds like he's saying that he only came for the Jews. Would Jesus ever say that he only came for the Jews? Never. What's his most famous parable? The Good Samaritan. A Samaritan was an enemy race that the Jews didn't like. The woman at the well was a Samaritan. Is Jesus a racist? No. Did he come only for the Jews? Paul says in Romans 1, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Who is the gospel preached to? All, everyone, just Jews? No, Gentiles, everyone, right? When Jesus reads his mission statement, it doesn't say, I've only come to set the Jews free. I've only come to, you know, heal the blind eyes of the Jews. No, so something here in his response has to be lost in translation, in how we're reading it in English. Let's look at how other translations record the same verse. In the American Standard Version, which is a very literal translation, says, but he answered and said, I was not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Hmm. The literal Standard Version, he answered them, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, I don't know why some translations remove the word not, because the word not is there in the Greek. But when you leave the word not in, it makes a double negative. <laughs> and us English-speaking folk, we don't take too kindly to double negatives, right? But that's what Jesus says. Listen again. I was not sent but, I was not sent except. It's almost like Jesus could be asking them a question, but in the form of a statement. The disciples say, send this dog away, right? And Jesus then kind of comes back with this question statement and he says, was I sent only to the house of Israel? Or maybe another way he could have said it was, I was not sent for only the house of Israel. Remember, he's teaching. And the disciples have already seen him heal women. They have also seen him heal Gentiles. But they don't argue for her. They don't make a case for her. So he's entering into another teachable moment. And notice all of this is said in her presence right? She's standing right there. She can hear everything. The disciples are trying to shoo her away. So she takes matters into her own hands and she pushes through the crowd. Verse 25, but she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. Ugh, I am so sick of these talking men, right? And again, she calls him Lord. The disciples seem to forget that they are also in the presence of their Lord. And they ask to drive this woman away. But Jesus is teaching. And here, here's what I want you to see. This often misunderstood passage is a very powerful scene. I bet it would be easier if you saw all the subtleties of the scene. But just try to picture it in your head and watch what happens next. He answered, 
It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Sure does sound like Jesus is a racist and a sexist. He just called her a dog. Did he? You know what we should never do? We should never take offense if the supposed offended person doesn't take offense. We can't be offended for another person, especially if they're not offended. This woman is not offended, and Jesus does not call her a dog, and she knows that. What is actually happening is this interaction between her and Jesus is really a side conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. He's saying something loud enough for them to hear. He wants them to be aware of what they are saying. And I imagine the scene, Jesus is smiling and he's looking at her in love and he says these words with a wink. Loud enough for the disciples to hear. And she gets it. And she plays along. She knows what the disciples think of her. She gets it. She's picking up on what Jesus is throwing down. And she doesn't miss a beat on Jesus' wordplay. Jesus isn't calling her a Gentile dog, a dog that should be shooed away. The disciples are. They're the ones that think this way. Do you see this? She is the one asking for mercy. She is the one who called him the son of David. She is the one who calls him Lord. And your proof is right what happens next. Then Jesus answered her, A woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This proves it. This proves she's not a dog. Because Jesus grants her request. And when you read these words, he again sounds uncaring towards her, but in truth, he is using her situation as a teachable moment for his disciples. If Jesus was really a sexist, if he was really a racist, then he wouldn't have performed the miracle. But maybe you're reading this and you're still thinking, I don't know. I don't get it, Pastor David. I still don't get it. Okay, then just keep reading. Keep reading and see what else you can discover. Because another thing that maybe causes us to not see the bigger picture sometimes in Scripture is that our English Bibles break everything down into chapter and verse and chapter heading, right? But sometimes the answers can be there if we just go on. Verse 29 says, Jesus went away from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. He went away from where? Well, Tyre and Sidon. But he's still in Gentile country. He hasn't left. He went up the mountain and sat down there, and a great crowd came to see him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them, so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled, healthy, the lame, walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Gentiles glorifying the God of Israel. Pagans glorifying the God of Israel. And again, what kind of person is Jesus? Does he turn away the opportunities to heal? No. Does he turn people away who ask for mercy? No. And this is in line with everything we know about Jesus, right? So we keep reading. Then Jesus called his disciples to him. Ah, get over here, you knuckleheads. <laughs> right? And he said... I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. Is Jesus compassionate? Yes, he just said he was. Does he meet people's needs? Yes. But did you notice Jesus waited three days to feed them? Why did you wait three days? Again, these thick, skulled disciples how come they didn't come, with that, come up with that idea on their own? They had seen Jesus feed 5,000. 4,000 would be a breeze, <laughs> right? Hey, Jesus, 
These people are hungry. Can you do what you did that last time? I think that'd be pretty cool. Nope. Doesn't even enter their minds. So another instance where Jesus is silent. He doesn't say anything for three days because he was a teacher and he's hoping, (laughs) right? Waiting, as teachers sometimes do, patiently waiting on tiptoe to see if your students have learned, right? Because the teacher always answers the question second or third or fourth. They wait to see if somebody will answer the question first. The teacher is willing to sit in awkward silence, waiting to see if someone has learned. Jesus waits three days. Jesus wasn't ignoring a Gentile woman. He's not ignoring a Gentile crowd of 4,000. He's a preacher. He's sharing the gospel with 4,000 people, but he's also a teacher. Now, of course, you remember the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. That's in Matthew 14. Verse 18 says, Bring them here to me, Jesus said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men beside women and children. Jesus feeds 5,000 people, and afterwards, they pick up 12 basketfuls of food. Why 12? Well, because we're in Israel, and the Israelites would recognize 12 as 12 tribes of Israel, right? Jesus had 12 disciples. Again, 12 tribes of Israel. So Jesus speaks, preaches, and heals for every Jew, right? every Jew. No tribes are excluded. Jesus provides for all, feeds all, loves all. So how does the story of Jesus feeding the 4,000 in Gentile territory go? Jesus says in verse 33, I am unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, where are we going to get enough bread (laughs) in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? They said seven and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish. And having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And after sending away the crowd, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. This time, no number 12, not 12 baskets. This time, seven loaves. And after seven loaves, seven baskets. Why seven and not 12? Why seven in Gentile territory? Well, seven is the number of perfection. It's the number of completion. Yes, Jesus cares for all of Israel, but his mission isn't complete until all are included. All includes Gentiles. All includes every race, every creed, every color, every nation, every language. Are we getting the picture? Jesus saw how his disciples were with just one Gentile woman. And a few days later, he wanted to see if they'd be any different with 4,000. And each time he has to show them, each time he has to teach them, I have come for all. As followers of Jesus, we need to be okay with all, more than okay. His mission of all needs to be our mission. So how can we be better? How can you and I be better than these thick-skulled disciples? How can we be a follower? Yes, but also a learner. Mark chapter 1 says, Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. 
And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. A teacher needs students. The coin is two-sided. Jesus is the teacher, yes, but only if we learn. And the church is the tool. The church is the only plan that God has in place to help him accomplish his goals. So yes, at one point, we are all taken by the hand to come and see the Messiah, but it's then that we make the choice that we are going to learn, that we're going to learn from him. Because the more we are willing to get involved, the easier it's going to be for all of us. Tell me something. What is your ministry here? What is your ministry here at the church? How do you serve? What role do you play? Jesus tells these disciples, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Right now, in the beginning of March, I'm thinking about Vacation Bible School. I'm already thinking about Vacation Bible School. And I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm wondering, who is going to help? Who is going to be here to volunteer? Who's going to serve? We skipped last year. We can't skip two years in a row. Who's going to be willing to step up and take these little children by the hand so that they can come and see Jesus? Do you think if Jesus were here in the church and the call went out for Vacation Bible School, do you think Jesus would be the first person to sign up? Or would he be quiet? Would he be still? Would he look around to see which of his disciples took action? Mark 2 says that when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that, it was at, that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Do you know what this is? Do you know what this story is? It's another one of those stories where they push through the crowd. Right? Except this time, others do it for the one who is in need. The friends of this man don't wait. They take action, but they don't take action for themselves. They do it for the love of their friend. So many of us think, well, what can one person do? Perhaps a little, but four can carry a stretcher. Two can build a pulley system. I know where I can get a ladder. I can help remove the roof. Listen, the text says when Jesus saw their faith, all of them working together, not just one, not just the one who needed healing, but the faith of the church. It is your faith. It is your prayers. It is your love for others that will one day enable other people to find their footing in the world. Verse 13 says, He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowds were coming to him. And he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the, sinner, the righteous, but sinners. One of Jesus' common see disciples was a tax collector, a Jew who was hired by Rome to extort money from his neighbors, a fellow Jew who grew rich off the kickbacks of being a good tax collector. And the religious leaders see the crowd that Jesus is hanging out with, and they're disgusted. 
as learners ourselves, we can never adopt the view of the Pharisees. The church will never grow. The kingdom of God will never grow if we're too good to associate with sinners. If we're above our neighbor. If we have enemies. As our teacher, Jesus, shows us an important truth here, the best way to get to know people is to meet them where they live. Include them when we go out. Invite them to dinner, to lunch. Extend the hand of friendship. Yes, people will walk in those doors on their own by themselves. Absolutely. But even more will come when we show them the way. Just, just as someone who once took you by the hand and said, come and see Jesus, we must continue that work for ourselves. The next chapter says, And he went up on the mountain and called to him those who he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also called apostles, so that they might be with him. He might send them out to preach, that they would have the authority to cast out demons. He appointed twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the, gave the name Bogeris, that is, the sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, the son, and Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Jesus calls students. His desire as a teacher is to have people to teach, right? We have to be that. And, and we might think, well, well, but God can't use me. When the church asks for help, when the church needs volunteers, when the church needs ministers, we mean you. <laughs> Look, Jesus chose Judas, knowing full well what kind of person he was, knowing what he would do. Jesus calls disciples, calls learners. But our job as a learner isn't just to walk behind him. Our job is to follow, follow our teacher. Jesus needs us to do our part so that he can do his part. The world needs the church right now, more than ever. We can't wait till COVID is over. Jesus needs us to model our faith right now because that's what's necessary to grow the kingdom and to bring other people to Jesus. And if we're gonna win them, it's gonna be done by being the church where they live. It's gonna mean outings and lunches and get-togethers and parties and fellowship and men's group and women's group and seniors and couples and date nights and Bible studies. And it means if you see a visitor, you either take them to Sunday school or you take them to lunch. Remember, we are called. The Bible uses the word appointed, right? Appointed the disciples, appointed the apostles. That's the word ordained, which is another way of saying produce or, or, or bear or, or shoot forth. We are called to shoot forth. We are called to produce, to show our teacher. I have sat down at your teaching, and I have learned, and I am ready to make your mission of all be my mission too. Let's pray. Lord, we must never stay away from the Bible because it is difficult. Yes, we enjoy to read the stories that make us happy, we like to read the stories that we remember from our childhood. We would like to read the stories that bring us peace, bring us comfort. But the difficult parts are also your word. They are also your instruction, and they are also to be obeyed. And as your students, as your followers, we must learn the difficult things just as much as we learn the easy things. Lord, you call us to a mission of all. 
The Bible says every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. The Bible says that all tribes, all nations, and all languages sit around the great feast in heaven. And as long as there is one sheep lost, your church has a mission of all. Lord, I don't want to be one who sits and only listens. I want to show that I am a learner. If you are teacher, then I am learner. And the only way to show you that I have learned is through my actions and my deeds. That I don't need these weekly reminders that I can get out there and I can do the work. I can do the mission on my own because I know it. And I can show you that I know it by the way I speak and by the way I act. I want to be that model for the world. That they would see you and know you and love you because of my words and how you use me. Because of my actions and how you use me. Someone once took me by the hand to come and see Jesus. And now it's my turn. Lord, in just a few months, we'll have Vacation Bible School. And I'm praying for it right now. I'm praying that people step up. That people care about the children of this neighborhood enough to say that they will help. That they will minister alongside this church so that little children can come and see Jesus. Amidst this pandemic, when they see people that are divided and afraid, that they wouldn't see those traits modeled by your church. And Lord, I pray for each member of this church, each member of every church across this great world, that they would feel the calling to step up and to serve their church, to serve their communities, not just financially, but with their muscles, with their words, with their knowledge, with their talents, with their skills. You gift and equip each one of us. Lord, help us to show that we have learned because you are a good teacher. You are a good teacher. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for listening to this podcast or you've been watching this on YouTube. Of course, there's a URL address up there at the top. You can always clip and copy that and post it to your wall or a friend's wall and share with everyone else the lessons uh, you've learned today. If you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to like this video so other people can find it faster and subscribe to this channel so that other people can find us. Thanks. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.